Want more Culturescape? Join our Patreon. Get sneak peeks, suggest guests, and join our exclusive Discord. Support Culturescape on Patreon today. As a person who is running counter narrative, I know that you pretty much have to run squeaky clean because, you know, the, there's forces out there that are trying to destroy you uh, on every level. I was coming out with my first novel. I just posted on my personal Facebook wearing a Trump hat on election night, and I got a nasty email from my editor just with this like wall of text saying, you know, I'm never going to be published again, et cetera, et cetera, if I don't, you know, change my behavior. And I'm like, what the heck? Then I wrote a blog about, hey, you know, we're supposed to be able to enjoy things like Star track comics whatever together we're supposed to come together and this is our entertainment we're supposed to just be able to have fun here uh these giant science fiction blogs just all just jumped on this and like roasted me about it that was actually the thing that got me the most heat ever people from bleeding cool came over to my blog they found my phone number they found my email address i, I was getting death threats i was getting all sorts of weird messages about my children and things like that it, it was wild so I've, I've made a full career and actually done better uh in just uh selling my comic books and my novels than uh than 99% of these people who are actually just trying to get, score cloud within these mainstream industries. Nobody would have come out with this or written, written these articles other than me because nobody in the conservative media landscape was bothering covering culture. She's retweeting all these people talking about her new book, which is called Star Trek Celebrations right here. Uh, which I'm, again, the only person who probably has a copy for real. There's massive problems coming for IDW down the pipeline. I have some information I'm going to be dropping uh, probably in the next couple of days that's pretty crazy. But I got an email from Todd McFarland's people, and I just said, sure, I'll, I'll have them on. Uh, they, they approached me, so that was the answer. <laughs> people are so burnt out on just how bad Star Wars has been since 2018 that they've tuned out. They don't care anymore. Vito was meant to find me so that he could convert to, to Catholicism. He is Italian. Yeah. See, it's all coming. It's all making sense now. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built nerd culture. I'm your host, Pete Pishke. Joining us today is none other than John Del Rose, a renowned figure in the independent comic book movement known as Comicsgate. John is also a prolific and award-winning author and longtime conservative journalist. Not just content with the written word, John also brings his creative flair to YouTube, where he shares his passion for comics and cultural commentary. From his early days in the media landscape of the 2010s to his current endeavors in comics, John has carved out a unique space for himself. In this conversation, we'll explore the trajectory of his career, dissect the often absurd state of conservative news media, and delve into the challenges and triumphs of building a brand and media business against all the odds. John, of course, is coming to us not long after debuting his excellent interview with the elusive comic book titan Todd McFarland, and I'm excited to have him with us here today. Welcome, John. Thanks, Pete. I know I've been meaning to come to the channel for a long time, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you are here. We've been uh, friends for a few years now, and whenever I check my, my YouTube tab and channels that your viewers are watching, you're always either one or two on that list. So I've been wow. wanting to get you here for a while. I'm happy with that. Hello, viewers. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> yeah, that, I was excited for you when you said, oh, and you know, because people are like, well, well, who does he have? What? Who is the mysterious guest that John has got? And I was asking, it's like, is it Gail Simone? And we're like, no, it's, it's Todd McFarland. And that's that's crazy. I had um, the reason the reason I don't actually even advertise my guests anymore until I do the interview proper uh, is about two years ago, I had uh, former Spider-Man writer J.M. DeMatteis set to come on the channel, and I advertised it. And, you know, within, you know, a couple of hours of my advertising it, uh, I get an email from the guy being like, oh, sorry, uh, my schedule's not working out. And it's like, well, can we schedule another time? Oh, no, I, I'm booked for, you know, and I'm like, you're kind of a retired writer. I'm pretty sure you're not booked. But uh, I, what I know happens 100% of the time is people concern troll these folk. Uh, even It even happened with Todd McFarlane. I, I got people tagging him going, do you know you're, you know, interviewing with an alt-right Nazi, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and, you know, fortunately he doesn't care. But a lot of people in the comic book industry are so scared. Uh, I call it a culture of fear in that industry uh, because they've got a whisper network that runs around. And if you you know, talk to the wrong people or don't uh, promote the right people in that said whisper network, uh, you're going to you're going to not have jobs. And uh, there's too many people who are aware of this. And so it's very, very easy to uh, to freak these people out of even just talking. It's it's kind of crazy. 
Oh, that is very true. That's been my experience throughout my career also. Uh, entertainment people, media people, comic book people who are like even more niche uh, than just typical uh, entertainment media people, very skittish, very much going along with the herd. Uh, it, it doesn't take much to spook them or just to be out of the realm of normal. And so I've had the experience where you set up interviews or, or talking with people, then maybe they check your YouTube or something you've done, or someone just says, oh, that bad person. You know, we get along, we're friends, we're buddies. And then some, someone hears about it, like, oh, you can't talk to him. Don't you know? Now, <laughs> I I wouldn't have heard a mayfly, but I mean, just the thought that I might have heard a mayfly is enough to scare some of these people, so... It can be ridiculous, I agree, but, I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, I don't know. Just uh, not not advertise the interviews in advance is what I do. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I was getting ready for this interview. I watched a five-year-old interview you had with Nick Rakita right before Nick Rakita went really big. So the interview probably only has like two, 3,000 views. But it's so interesting watching that and then everything going down now with Nick. I thought that was, uh, that, that was really, I think that's, uh, kind of fascinating, kind of sad. Yeah. It's, it's really, to me, to me, uh, Nick always supported, uh, you know, the people who are kind of on the alternate side of culture. And he always was kind of going con, uh, counter narrative towards the mainstream media. And so he was an easy, uh, ally early on. And it was, it was always like, just nice to talk to him. He actually, has a little interest in comics. He's really into Warhammer 40K, if you ever talked to him about that. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just, I don't know exactly the specifics of what happened, but, you know, as a person who is running counter-narrative, I know that you pretty much have to run squeaky clean uh, because, uh, you know, the, there's forces out there that are trying to destroy you uh, on every level. And some of them are very intentional, like the people in the comic book industry. And I also believe that there's demonic forces out there that are, are absolutely trying to, uh, you know, push uh, people and tempt people into just uh, horrible things in order to just bring down uh, the whole of uh, Christendom and things like that. And so, uh, you know, you, it's easy, easy to get tempted. It, it's easy to have problems. And uh, clearly, just like watching some of the clips, I mean, you could tell that uh, he's struggling with uh, with at least some form of addiction. And, uh, you know, I, I hope he gets better. And that's... Uh, He's always been a, a very pretty stalwart ally in all of this, and uh, I, I I find it more sad than funny. I know uh, a lot of people are out there, you know, kind of milking that controversy right now, but uh, I've intentionally chosen not to, even though it would give me super chats and make me a ton of money. Uh, I'm I'm just not doing it in this instance. Not not leaking all the DMs you've had with Nick. Not like oh, you know, I, I've seen a right. lot of people who are very much holier than thou. About this, I, I I giggle a little bit, but that's you know this is just how people are. They they, they pretend to, they pretend or they do like you when you're popular, when it's easy to like you. But as soon as things change or something happens, I mean, now you're the lol cow. Now we're going to make fun of you and people. You know that that's kind of the danger, and you know this very well because you've worked in various places and media. It's like when you're hot, you're beloved. When you're not, then you're just some loser, and and it, it's sad, but. In my experience, especially with media, uh, that is more true than pretty much anything else. Yeah, it's a weird clout game, uh, and people think that uh, they can, you know, climb those clout rat ladders by dunking on uh, other people. I, you know, I I think it works in the short term, maybe because it gets them a little bit of popularity, but long term, I I never see that working so great. Uh, so I I don't think it's a it is an ugly aspect of media, but you know, I I don't I. I just don't see the people like who are just clamoring on this right now uh, really gaining much long term out of it. They're just going to have to find another uh, target of the week to go at in a couple weeks. So when this is when this news kind of settles down and, uh, you know, eventually you kind of run out of targets or you run out of friends. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, the true. Well, I hope Nick is OK. I don't totally know what to think of the situation, but I hope that all works out. All right. Uh, you mentioned that, that you feel like there are, are demons amongst amongst the culture and i in some ways i do agree with you i've been reading a lot i i go you know like many people uh with adhd i kind of go in phases by men too so right now i'm really into studying the paranormal near-death experiences like two-year-olds claiming you know that they used to be world war ii veterans all kinds of crazy stuff i i, I, I you know part of me is like when i see what's happened to the culture and some people i know 
you know, and I, I grew up in abuse. I've seen a lot of things and like mental illness, addiction, a lot of these to explain it. But sometimes I do wonder, I do my, you know, my, we're, uh, we both know Vito who is, uh, agnostic atheist and he, he doesn't believe in any of this stuff. Nothing, uh, th- at least that he can prove that it exists. And I, I know sometimes I'm just like, well, I don't know, because there's always that ounce that always ounce in my head, like, Hey, this doesn't totally make sense. There's something else going on here. So I'm not. There's, to- w- there's way too many things that can't be explained uh, by just like the direct observable physical. It's where the it's kind of where scientism and and that's where you know I've kind I've kind of you know checked the left on this in a long time, and, th- and that's the religion at this point. It's scientism. It's not science uh, because science is about performing experiments, but their their scientism religion is this is all that exists, the here and now. It's a, it's a very, like, nihilistic uh, kind of way to look at things. Um, and on top of it, like, you know, it you, you, you see, like, you know, with the COVID situation, how crazy people go on uh, when, it, when it becomes sort of like a religious experience for them. Uh, and uh, I think that aspect of our culture is just, uh, you know, uh, almost worse than the whole clout media thing uh, because uh, people get so programmed in that regard. But the the uh, the supernatural, I mean, I it it's observably real. I mean, there there's too many things that happen that are crazy. Like you've you you probably have instances even in your life where somebody had cancer or something, and then miraculously it's gone and it's healed, and nobody can explain it. Um, these things happen on a regular basis. Miracles happen. And the other uh, aspect of it, on the flip side, is evil ob- objectively exists. Uh, you can see it, and you can. You can feel it, uh, the, that feeling that you get when, when there's something just tangibly evil uh, around. Uh, you know, sometimes you're walking across the street and it feels like a meth head or something like that, but it feels way worse than that. There's like an oppressive, like, force there. Uh, and that that's where I think, like, the demonic, like, seeps into people uh, from time to time. I am not totally disagreeing. I do think that there, I think evil exists. I think sometimes there's maybe overextent to what evil is, but there's too many weird things and there's too many too many people that end up doing really really horrible things where you know the typical explanations don't quite fit but that's not really where i wanted to take this conversation i just thought that was a, a curious bit so you're someone you, you know you have been doing the the conservative independent also media game way uh, yeah way longer than i have and you're much better at it in many ways so i really want to get into that but to get to lay the the groundwork so people know who you are uh how would you describe yourself and then how did you get into all this what what are the what is the origin story of uh jda sure i was just writing comics and rpgs and uh helping out companies in in uh card games board games and things like that with their lore and uh and and writing novels too in science fiction just a big star trek fan all the way back um, and, uh, I just kept doing it. Finally, I was, I was coming out with my first novel and, uh, you know, I, I just posted on fit my personal Facebook wearing a Trump hat on election night. And I got a nasty email from, uh, my editor, um, you know, just with this like wall of text saying, you know, I'm never going to be published again, et cetera, et cetera. If I don't, you know, change my behavior. And I'm like, what the heck? Uh, and and uh, as that kind of came out, uh, and she warned me, she said it was publishing is a very small world, and it turns out it's true. I mean, soon enough, I was like, you know, this convention I'd been speaking at, even though I had 300 followers and wasn't really somebody. Now I have a novel out, and it's like a real thing. Uh, they they stopped allowing me to come speak there, and it's like, well, wait a minute, what happened? What changed between this year and last year? I talked to somebody who worked for them. They said, well, they didn't like the Trump thing, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, and so I was kind of, and then I wrote a blog about, Hey, you know, we're supposed to be able to enjoy things like Star Trek comics, whatever together, we're supposed to come together. And this is our entertainment. We're supposed to just be able to have fun here. Um, let's leave this politics crap out of the conventions. And, uh, these giant science fiction blogs just all just jumped on this and like roasted me about it. Um, and from there on out, I was kind of just backed into, uh, forcing like, I guess, uh, the, uh, um, political commentary i've always been a you know christian conservative like my entire life too um so it's not like you know it's not like i've i've changed paths or even like Mm -hmm. looked at things differently you know i think uh you know i probably wouldn't vote for george bush now because george bush is uh a leftist to me (laughs) but you know that's the times changing more than anything else and the fact that he did 9-11 of course um but um (laughs) uh but uh you know i i probably 
like in for in terms of like you know what I wanted to do online and writing and all that, I really just wanted to just enjoy what I enjoyed and write my science fiction and comics. And this this was kind of like I was forced down this path because I got just lambasted by by big names in in uh, science fiction. John Scalzi, uh, Kurt Busiek from Marvel Comics. Like I mean, they were just coming at me out of nowhere, and I'm like, what the heck's going on? Now, when uh, in the middle of that storm happening. Um, I wrote another blog and I did a bunch of research for this one uh, about Marvel Comics. And I, I, I went and I, I looked, I, I made a list of every Marvel Comics writer back in 2017 uh, who worked for the company. And I went through every single one of their Twitter accounts and every single one of their Twitter accounts was posting anti-Trump, anti-Christian stuff. Uh, it, it wasn't even, there was nobody who was even silent about it. Uh, and that's what was going on there. Now, that blog got picked up by Bleeding Cool. Rich Johnson, who is a big comic book news sort of website. And he lambasted me and he actually titled it How Not to Get a Job at Marvel Comics. Well, in my blog where I was making fun of their political situation here, I posted at the bottom saying, hey, I noticed none of these guys are really diverse. They've all got the exact same opinions. If you want to hire somebody who's actually diverse, why don't you hire me, C.B. Sobolski, who's editor in chief of Marvel Comics. So I made a joke on it and he took it like it was serious and then used his post to lambast me. Again, I'm a nobody at this time. I maybe had three or 400 followers on Twitter, never really interacted with these people. So it's like, why is this like comic book news website like using my blog to like just totally destroy me? And um, that was actually the thing that got me the most heat ever. People from Bleeding Cool came over to my blog. They found my phone number. They found my you know uh, email address. I, I was getting death threats. I was getting all sorts of weird messages about my children and things like that. Um, it, it was wild. So at that point, that went mega viral because of him. And that's how the Federalists then contacted me and said, hey, you did pretty good work here. Would you, uh, would you come right for us? And that's where I actually got into the journalism end of things. Yeah, you were, you were writing uh, for the Federalists till March 2019, which is the same time when I came on board. So, oh, wow, we just missed each other. Yeah. Um, it's so crazy. I, I, it, it, you know, now I feel like in some ways we are getting past some of it, but going back to just post Trump election, it was like so many people, it felt like to me had, you know, had their brains taken over because it was all of a sudden, everything is now political. You know, even though these communities were very niche and couldn't really afford to get political, if you were even saying things like, well, you know, let's keep politics separate from all this, you were the bad guy, right? They, they would treat that that would, like that was some kind of dog whistle, and, and yes. it, was, it was nuts. Uh, you couldn't even say that. And that was the, again, that's what my blog said originally. So it's like, it, I wasn't really like saying much in terms of uh, anything, uh, you know, substantive. It was literally just that. And uh, that that's what got me that negative attention. I, I wonder if in a different uh, parallel universe, what JDA is doing there. Maybe, maybe you would have worked for Marvel. Maybe you'd be... Uh, at some uh, publishing firm right now, but you still have those 300 followers. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I know it, it ended up uh, being a very interesting thing because I would join these professional organizations and there's a few different professional organizations. Like one uh, was called Codex Writers and they like requ their requirement was like you had to have like three short story sales of one cent per word. Which, uh, you know, would end up like these, I, I did the math and like you had to like have sold $500 worth of stuff to be considered a professional writer in that club. And most of those people only did sell short stories. And if I look back on some of the ones who actually got mad at me in that club and kind of lambasted me at that point, that's all about all they made is a couple grand at this point. So I, I've made a full career and and actually done better uh, in just uh, selling my comic books and my novels and actually my journalism stories too than uh, than. 99% of these people who are actually just trying to get, score cloud within these mainstream industries. It's it's actually a really sad structure that they have. I would love to just immediately jump into Heather Ontos and Star Trek and all that, but I want to just touch, you know, this is just for me. This is not for my audience. It's completely selfish on my part. I, I find your time conservative media fasting. In many ways, I mean, you still do write for like PJ Media right now. I did that whole world is so interesting to me. Like you, like uh, you've told me before, like you broke a lot of the stories, you know, people like the court, uh, before he was the quartering, Jeremy Hambly, back when all, everything was going on with Magic TCG. He was TCG. the quartering then. The quartering was just a Magic the Gathering channel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
you were the one that covered him, but that's not the the only instance. There there are several instances where people in conservative land or YouTube got big after their their uh, I got canceled story, and you were usually the one covering them being canceled. Yeah, I regret it at this point. I always say like uh, I I made a big mistake. I, I tried to be in writing and to be writing journalism stories on these topics to like be a little more serious and. Because I, you know, I, I really like the written word of journalism and, and written word in general. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's a valuable thing and, and something that we're obviously losing because, uh, you know, video is is uh, really some a, a dumber medium. No offense, people watching. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, at that at that same point, like I'd write these stories and my my uh, story for Jeremy about Jeremy Hambly, you know, being banned in Magic, which kind of actually propelled him to the next level. I wrote that for Milo Yiannopoulos's. Uh, uh, column. And uh, I did that and I was just writing for there. And ag again, with Richard C. Meyer, Diversity in Comics, the YouTuber also, uh, not quite not quite as big as the quartering, of course, but he's got, a, you know, 100,000, 200,000 subs. And he blew up because I wrote about him and how he was getting harassed by mainstream comics also. And so what I noticed back in 2017, 2018 uh, was I was writing all these stories about people that, that, that my stories would go viral, but nobody would look up the person who actually broke the story or wrote the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you just get, you know, off into oblivion. They'd all, they'd all call Richard C. Meyer or Jeremy Hambly to go on their radio show and talk about their experiences based on what I was writing. And so it was like, huh, they just got like a national radio tour uh, because I wrote an article and yet I'm still here and uh, nobody even knows like that I did this or and nobody would have come out with this or written, written these articles other than me because nobody in the conservative media landscape was bothering covering culture except for me at the time. So really weird stuff. Um, and so I started really getting serious about YouTube in 2020. And that's where I kind of just like re-evaluated my time and stuff. And I just, you know, grinded things up from then. It was a different time at that point because YouTube isn't the Wild West anymore. There's so many different cultural commentators already so it's like it took me a while to build things up but i finally got to a point where it's like i've got a like you know a reasonable following uh, i don't i don't think i'm a big youtuber yet by any means but i'm i've got a moderate following and uh if i'd only been doing the, the kind of work on youtube then that i was now i i think uh, my channel would probably be as big as theirs i've had that thought often myself but then i think well i wouldn't know the things i know i wouldn't have the certain experiences i have that maybe make it work now but that could be just uh, cope. Uh, I could be huffing the copium cope. there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it was a mistake. Uh, it definitely was a mistake. I mean, so this is uh, this is where the the media landscape's at these days. I am seeing a lot of people. Uh, I think everything going on with Google right now, how it's just choking all traffic out for pretty much all news, both big and small. I'm seeing a lot more people try to pivot to video, and a lot of them, some of them can, many of them can't. And, uh, you know, I, I think video is fantastic, but I also think there's a place for the written word. Part of me feels like, though, and maybe this is just not me being very charitable, part of me feels like, though, especially for conservative media, they kind of earned a lot of this on their heads for their lack of interest in culture, for not building up. You know, conservative media is unfortunately a place that doesn't really reward a lot of uh, good effort and work. If you want to make it in these places, you often have to, you often have, you know, it's like what people say, the left, you often have to go to the right schools, you know, the right people, you know, how to play the game. And while there is value in that, it, it just, it just kind of, it didn't really lead to having them, uh, you know, a, a wide nest or a strong wall of protection when all this is coming their way. And I, I like, I like news media in general, and I like to work, work in mainstream or conserve news, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting place. Uh, I mean, you are still writing for conservative news media right now. What do you what do you think of that experience? What do you think of of those experiences? And do you it's, how do it's you think frustrating because I, I firmly want to stay in culture, and that's what I care about. So I, I want to talk about uh, science fiction and comics and and uh, things like that. But I also know that like every time I write a piece like that for PJ Media, like if I would have just written whatever you know comments about somebody said about Trump that day instead, I would I would have. 10 to 100 times the clicks and uh and and in, in an environment where you do get paid uh kind of by the click it is it, it's it's tough um and i i've resisted it pretty well because like again i just don't want to migrate in that space uh but that's where it, that's where it's at uh for that kind of media and until we can get i i guess our people paying attention past that 
uh, you know, we are going to be fighting an uphill battle, not just, um, not just like in, in, uh, the culture, which is where it's, it's tough, but in politics too, because like the culture, uh, propaganda apparatuses really do influence politics on a level that like, you know, it's not like, you know, I, I always like look, laugh at the undecided voters or whatever. These people are already decided and they're decided because they're programmed by all the things they watch over and over again. Uh, and so, uh, if you can't, uh, compete in that space, uh, you're going to have a hard time going forward. And I really think we're reaching that point as a society where it is it is getting pretty one-sided. True. Click, clicks can be deceptive. Clicks are great, but you, sometimes you have to be smarter than the algorithms. And sometimes you do have to cover more boring stuff for to a more niche audience. I mean, there is value in that, but I don't think media always understands that, especially conservative media. I'm not sure that's going to change uh, anytime soon. All right. Well, we'll we'll move on from that. I know that's not everyone's favorite topic, just mine. Uh, let's talk about uh, comic books and Heather Antos and terrible. Oh, I don't under I do understand, but I don't understand why in the world they put her in charge of IDW. Uh, terrible, awful, garbage Star Trek comics, uh, which I of course know. I'm the only person who reads them, uh, so I, I I really am am sure. I was just, uh, I was actually looking at uh, videos for tomorrow and I, I'm actually thinking about going through because she's retweeting all these people talking about her new book, which is called Star Trek Celebrations right here, uh, which I'm, again, the only person who probably has a copy for real. Um, and it's, it's an anthology about uh, gay stuff. And so every, it's just slice of life people. Um, it's literally like, uh, like two lesbians going to a high school reunion. And then uh, two lesbians going to a pleasure planet on a date. And then uh, I, I don't know what to call them. So like uh, you, have, you have Nurse Chapel, who's a lesbian with a trans black dude. But I, it would, it's not a dude. It's a she. Uh, oh, you know, as a so couple, is that I lesbian? don't know what to call that either. No, I yeah, don't know what to call so, that either. I don't know. Right. And so it's like, that's all it is. And it's like, who, you know, what are we, are we exploring strange new worlds? I mean, I guess they're exploring Uranus. <laughs> um, but uh and, and that's all it, it, it the art's bad the dialogue's bad it's just like it's it's literally just there just to have those moments published and it's like what the heck is happening here um and so um there you know obviously like what happens is it's it's again the cloud structure uh, i i really think happens because she got her job with star trek after coming out of valiant comics and valiant comics laid everybody off and was failing and it's like she just had her cloud so she got in here because like you know who care you know and she got that from being like an intern at marvel before that and got her cloud just by like complaining about harassment on the internet and so at this point you kind of have to hire her in order to like look good to your the 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 i don't know i don't know who but some people i guess and then uh and then she causes problems and uh, there's massive problems coming for IDW down the pipeline. I have some information I'm going to be dropping uh, probably in the next couple of days uh, via my sub stack and um, uh, on YouTube also. That's uh, that's pretty crazy. But uh, it's uh, it's a wild, wild environment. And I, I don't understand it because it's pretty obvious if you just get rid of her and her people and just bring in professional writers who know what they're doing, you'd have a better product and then people would like it better. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's baffling. It really is. Because IDW, I mean, they do have some some IP that are, are beloved, but I mean, they don't have anything like DC and Marvel. So DC and Marvel, they may be able to coast a bit more. IDW does not have that wiggle room yet. No, they they've been laying off a bunch. They delisted themselves off the New York Stock Exchange. They've been struggling as a company big time. Wow. Uh, and with that, uh, they've actually lost IPs because they used to have Transformers and GI Joe. They wow. lost that to uh, Skybound <laughs> with Robert Kirkman now, who's doing. Who actually revitalized those properties those properties were a disaster before um and uh they've really done a great job over there at skybound um but they're down to star trek sonic which actually there's a niche audience who loves sonic and uh uh and actually they have not done a bad job with those comics either believe it or not um and then uh teenage mutant ninja turtles uh which she kind of doesn't control because uh, kevin eastman kind of has his own kind of control over it um, and that's really what's kept them alive was Kevin Eastman doing a, a storyline called The Last Ronin, where it was his original vision of like what happens to the mm -hmm. turtles later as kind of like uh, they're like the end story. And it, it did very well. 
And I think they also have like maybe My Little Pony or something, but you know, that that's something that doesn't really move the needle. <laughs> yeah, for a while they were trying to grab like all the like uh, older millennial brands, like all, all what yeah. was what was hip. So we'll grab Transformers, we'll grab GI Joe, we'll grab you know uh, TMNT. They already had obviously. Um, I think Mega Man was on the plate at one point. All kinds of things. And I I Last Ronin, by the way, is an excellent comic. Like great that, book. 100%. Yeah, percent. Totally worth. The Rantos had nothing to do with that. Yeah, yeah. And from my understanding, for the Sonic thing, that's kind of almost its own separate universe too. Because the guy that's that was kind of allowed to write the Sonic comics is like, he has some kind of relation to the original show, and he's like a super fan. And uh, considering Sega's past relationship with Archie, I think IDW has to is like you know, always has Sega looking their eyes down at them. So I don't know, but that I don't. They're so. The Star Trek comics are so bad, and they are in so many ways. I don't like to use this term, but social justice warrior, like it's like like TM to the nth degree. It's beyond ridiculous. Like you, if you ask someone, so what happened to comic books? Like why all of a sudden do people not want to read comics? It's, it's that. It's this. It's like it doesn't make. It look, put aside like. The obviously the LGBT stuff. It's like this is boring. No one wants to watch a story about uh, uh, the people on DS Nine going to prom. No one wants that. <laughs> that that uh, why would I buy that? I could read that. I could read that fan fiction anywhere. And the Star Trek audience. It's like uh, Vic Mignogna, who was on recently. You know, guy in his mid mid to late fifties. Many 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 of the Star Trek fans are guys in their fifties sixties. 70s these are not the kind of people that you market the the gay prom book to it makes zero sense okay i'm done correct and uh it, it's it's really funny uh vic vic incidentally uh his star trek continues that he just did unlicensed and kind of got in trouble for was something that uh actually like did better than the properties before um and so let me pause because it's still coming on <laughs> the background so Hold on. There's a whole scene going behind you. I yes. love it. Okay, hold on. Okay, so we're we're talking about comic books. I'll just jump in here. By the way, uh, I love your dog. That was a fun interaction, <laughs> folks. <laughs> I was like, uh, I want to look at this. You know, while while you were talking to your contractor people who are helping you with your house thing, I was like, okay, so let's look at it. what is the median age of the comic book buying audience. So, in the 1986, 1986, the New York Times did an article on this. According to Marvel at the time, the average comic book reader was 20 years old. What do you think it is today, John? 45. Try again. Higher? Higher. 50. The median ad, the median comic book buyer is 50 and over, according to wow. ICV2. And that was 2017, 2019. Uh, if you think that's bad, guess what? The other part of the demographic for Star Trek is, of course, TV. So I was like, because I, I, my mom, uh, as a gift uh, for her birthday, I got her a subscription that I've been paying for to uh, Paramount because they have all the NCIS you could ever want, right? <laughs> CBS, this is insane, okay? The median age for network watching TV previously was always thought to be at 50, about 50. It is now at 64.6. With some wow. networks and shows going above 70. Blue Bloods is in the 70s. I, I, I don't wow. I'm trying to see what it is on here. So it's like I was saying. It's like the people who would be interested. 73 years old is the median age of a Blue Bloods viewer. <laughs> <laughs> I, wow. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, there it's you like, go. That's the comic you're going to make? That's, that's, what, that's your audience? So I don't want Heather on toast. If she comes out, she says, I just don't understand why our comics wouldn't sell. Why are people no longer reading comics? It's a mystery. Well, the weird part to me is that is they really gaslight everybody. And if you look at posts of her, she hasn't done one of these recently, but it was about a year ago um, when I was uh, just talking about how bad things were at Star Trek. She'd be like, you know, she'd make a post saying that like it, it, her Star Trek's doing the best ever, like since 2019 or something. And I looked at it and I'm like, well, and I looked at what was coming out in 2019 and it was like, well, they had a couple like Star Trek Discovery limited series. 
And then 2020 hit, and, that, and that's COVID, so comics shut down. And so now her Star Trek features, like, not Discovery people, but the, at least the characters from the 90s. Well, of course it's going to do better than Discovery in the COVID era where you weren't even producing comics. Like, that's that's not a high bar. Uh, but, but I cannot imagine they've continued to do well, especially as uh, they've been running these weird series... Uh, oh, I could rant about it for hours, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's easy it's to do. I know. <laughs> yeah, it it drives it it will drive you up just absolutely up a wall. But at least though, in response to that, there is a thriving independent comic scene uh, on multiple levels, and you are someone that does a lot of independent comics. I swear, every time I look into what you're doing, you're on yet another project. You have yet another comic. That's maybe where I'm doing it wrong because I, I have so I, I'm so prolific and have so much of a library while everything uh, moves pretty well. I, I'm not staying on one topic uh, very well. And so uh, maybe I'm not growing the audience in terms of like one line fast enough. Uh, but I like to be prolific and I like to actually like exercise creativity. I, I you know, I'm, I, I really don't want to be trapped uh, in one thing uh, that's, you know, as a brand, I want to be a true artist. And so uh, I do. I, I, I've got 12 full graphic novels now. Um, I'm working on, gosh, pro I've got five or six more in development at the moment. Um, and then I'm also, you know, working on my, I think, 19th or 20th novel I'm writing right now. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm trying to just just flood content um, in, the, in the hopes that I can just build my own universe and several universes uh, to really replace everything that's out there. So if you're a JDA fan of like my actual content, like you're you're usually pretty happy because there's always something coming out. You're never gonna just like wait two three years for the next like installment of a short book or something like that. I I I want to say last year you were working on a project for an Andrew Tate book. I made an Andrew Tate parody book, making fun of the Andrew Tate book because so the the lore behind this and I, and I I like memes and I'm I'm a meme culture guy. So uh, Andrew Tate came out with a comic book last year, an officially licensed one, and he was selling the the comic book for ninety seven dollars plus seventeen dollars shipping, um, and <laughs> so and and it was like a thirty page comic book, uh, and the art was atrocious. Uh, it was literally just Andrew Tate, you know, beating up people in tanks and things like that. It was it was ridiculous, um, and so I I made fun of it, and he called it Top G. So I made a book called Top Grift because that that comic was obviously a grift, <laughs> and uh, and it, and it made fun of it. That the whole intention of Top Grift, which did not actually star Andrew Tate, it was a guy who's like uh, going online trying to like better himself, and so he goes and finds these online manosphere grifters, and there's a bunch of them, and so he uh, and he 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 signs up for the course on how to be a better man, and of course it fails, and he has to like learn how to actually like do things himself. Uh, in my book, so it was it was a commentary book on uh, like that sort of manosphere grifting. A uh, little too heady for the comic book audience, I think. So, <laughs> but, it, but it was it was really nice, and I had art from Mike, Mike S. Miller who did DC's Injustice. So, like it was yeah. a, like top tier comic book. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a you know little little esoteric of a topic. Mike is an excellent artist. I uh, he he. It's sad that he kind of got pushed out of all that because he actually is pretty talented, but. It goes back to that politics culture thing that they just it's can't annoying. seem to handle it. <laughs> it is. It is. It's 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 frustrating. It's frustrating because there are a good many creative people who might be right of center, uh, and their vision, their interests that shouldn't be pushed out. It can lead to very interesting things. You don't necessarily see this in Japan. You know, the guy that does Attack of Titan is right winged. I would say almost in some ways fascist. But it leads to such an interesting artistic creation because he has this di really different point of view, and that feeds into his work. And what you know, going back to Chuck Dixon and the stuff that he was doing in the '90s, you know, coming from that direction, it leads to a different output. And it's it's sad that no, that they don't want that. They don't want they don't want diversity of thought. They don't want diversity of creation. That's right. You need a diversity of storytelling, and that's why I'm doing things like a, a, a silly book like Top Grift. You know, I wrote a romance novel last year, uh, and you know, I, I I want to have all sorts of different things. Like, just as an artist, like it, it's really interesting to do that. Now, I've I've learned my lesson to some degree. Just sales wise, I I know what's going to sell, uh, and I know that my audience wants more of just like uh, you know science fiction, 
space exploration, space war type things. Uh, and so I'm, I'm moving this direction this year of I'm going to be putting out a second volume of my uh, science fiction, you know, cl uh, classic comic, which just did excellent a couple of years ago, which was Overmind. And uh, that's going to be my next project. And then I'm spinning something out of that, which is going to be a space marine deal because of the whole Warhammer 40K situation going on. I figured, you know what, I'll just write my own space marines and and, uh, and bring my people on for that. And uh, so I'm building a universe and, you know, we're going to have three or four different lines going soon. So I'm going to have basically my own Star Wars uh, set up going on very shortly here. And uh, those self like hotcakes. Uh, it's 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 really interesting to watch that. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that I put a, a, out a lot of my books on Amazon. I, d I don't just crowdfund, which is, you know, a lot of people have gotten stuck in just the, you've got your book on Indiegogo and that's it. And then, and, and, you know, and that's nice because you get to see a leaderboard. So, so the audience likes on Twitter, like to go, yeah, you know, we're almost to $20,000, get us over the hump. And then they go, we got you there. And, and, and it's fun to do that. But on the back end on Amazon, I've been watching, I've just been slowly selling books and I, I've sold like 600 books this month on Amazon and another uh, 300 last month. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, I've moved more than a thousand units this year, just like in the traditional kind of market without that going on. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm using bull and the, and when you write as much as I do, you can actually put things in different markets, uh, and, uh, and actually really expand the audience that way. And that's the way you need to do it for the conservative side and, and for anybody in the independent, you need to reach out to different markets, staying in the same silo, trying to mine the same thousand people is, is not going to be a good long-term strategy. Yeah, especially these days when, you know, the plug can get pulled on someone so quick. If you don't right. have a, a if you don't have multiple platforms that you're working through, then you're toast. I'm very scared about that with YouTube because I think I'm getting big enough to where I'm going to get noticed very soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, you know, I, I hope not, but that could be what happens. Google has created this situation where basically they don't want anyone. I, we talked a lot about this uh, on the show, but they're creating a situation where they're basically making it impossible for anyone else really to generate attention for their, their sites or content, unless it's Google's. So that's YouTube. Right. So that's where everyone is now going. Um, right. And then if you go, if so, if everyone is going to YouTube and then there's a, but, you know, if you're conservative or such and such, then you're not allowed to be here. Well, then that's like, okay, so I guess they're not allowed to be anywhere. Uh, yeah. Which, that doesn't seem very fair to I've me. I've had a problem with, uh, with censorship. I, I started my own pop culture news website, which was taking off. <clears throat> and it was a lot of fun. December, I, I looked at my views and I was getting about 500 views a day. January, I was getting 1,000 views a day. February, I was getting 2,000 views a day. March, with the Sweet Baby Ink stuff, was starting to take off to where I was getting like three, four, five thousand 5,000 views on these days. And then I looked on my Google Analytics page, and I, it was search engine traffic. It was going like this for, for four straight months. And then it flatlined to zero impressions served on, Z on Google. And it stayed at zero from March through like the middle of May. And I was like, wow, Google just like told but their algorithm, somebody went in there and just said, this site will not show up on any search engine search results for any topic. Um, and it just killed me. And then, uh, like, I was maybe able to get past that for a bit, but then I got mass reported after my Doctor Who stories started going big uh, on Facebook, and Facebook labeled my site as spam, and they removed any uh, link to the site. And I, I tried to appeal it, nothing, because you can't even get to a real person over there. And so Facebook, it, believe it or not, for written written print news, because Facebook's all boomers on there, that's where you want to be. Uh, so with Google and Facebook just killing the traffic, like, uh, you know, I've got I've got no way to move forward with that. And so that's why I'm moving over to Substack now, because Substack actually likes free speech. And I, I direct people there personally. They're on a list at that point. And so it's, it's, it's a much uh, more stable audience. And I don't have to rely on uh, advertising revenue because people actually just give subscriptions over there. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've dealt with the censorship pretty hard, uh, over the last few months here. You might have an answer to this question. Uh, and I agree. I, I'm not, I don't like it. I was just talking with a friend of mine, Pat Anson. He's the, he owns, operates a uh, pain news network, which is a tiny little health, uh, medicine website. And they're like, we don't know if we can keep doing this. We might just have to shut down because it's just costing us way too much. And you know, we're not getting any traffic at all or we were getting an okay amount. So there, that's the story with so many, so many websites, so many journalists, so many writers, and it's deplorable. It's awful. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what 
is there an advantage that conservative media may have in surviving this? Because I'm thinking like maybe their audience is more built in or because they have like Fox News and talk radio, maybe that protects them. Where do you think, because I I I have been curious about this and you've done a lot of work in conservative media. How do you think all this plays out with everything happening with Google and traffic being sucked down and everything else? Do they survive? Do they thrive? I think you, I think you have to uh, like kind of wean yourself from those systems and not rely on them. So, you know, build, build your platforms, places, YouTube, Twitter, whatever, and as, just assume that you're going to get banned. And so you got to, you got to funnel the audience into a subscription model uh, and things like that to where you're anti-fragile, right? And you can't, and if they ban you, you're still going to get seen, you know, because you've got your, your audience or whatnot. Um, and that's kind of where it's at. And so, uh, like I said, Substack's a, a really good place because of that. It's, uh, they're very committed to, to free speech. They don't really ban people over nonsense. And, uh, and the best part about it is it generates an email list of everybody that's on there. So I, you know, I make sure to download that once a month. If somebody does ban me, I have the list of everybody who reads my Substack anyway, I can move it to a newsletter or something, you know, um, it's, uh, there, there, there's ways around it, and it's really about making sure you have a platform that you control how you interact with your audience uh, and directly, so it's not with a third party in the middle. That's smart. Yeah, M- Milo, you said you you did some work for Milo. He's someone that, that that's kind of what happened, where he was everywhere, and then they pulled the plug on him wherever he was, and then he was gone. He just never happened. Yeah, it, uh, he got removed from the internet. Like, I mean, you want to talk about canceled uh, he got just absolutely uh, memory hold, dismissed, gone. They got him out of everywhere, uh, and it, it was uh, it, it's just shocking to see like how that went. Now, part of it, you know, was his own doing and reaction and and et cetera. But at the same time, like I mean, I, I've never seen somebody canceled that hard. I'm glad he's been allowed back on X uh, lately because uh, you know he's seeming to like be building some sort of revitalization like of interest in him right now. And, and, uh, you know, I, I really like what he's done, of course, converting to Catholicism, uh, and abandoning, uh, what I, you know, a, a degenerate lifestyle is, uh, is, is actually a, a great role model. And of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the clown world, uh, group does not want people to see that role model at this juncture at all. Yeah. He's quite a, he's quite a character. You never quite know what's going to happen with him next. I do believe I, you know, I, I've read some of your stuff before. I think I read your Star Realms book, and that might have, you know, I was reading up on you. That might have been your first book. That was my first book, which yeah. is odd because Vito, who I mentioned earlier in the show, that was he worked on Star Realms, so small world. Yeah, and uh, that's actually how I got to know him before we were like in, involved in these content games or whatever. Um, I would talk with Vito about Magic the Gathering and Star Realms because we were just gamers. Um, and uh, and got to know him very well at that point, and it's it's really funny because I get a lot of people like, "Don't you know Vito's this bad person?" Like all the time to me, and I'm just like, uh, "Yeah, I've known Vito since like 2014, so uh, good luck <laughs> you know, getting getting me to cancel him." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's cr- you know sometimes it happens though. It's like in this huge you know in the 300 million people, you know these weird these weird small connections happen, uh, and maybe that is maybe that's a sign of the divine. I don't know how else that could happen. Maybe, or maybe it's just stochasticity. That's right. V- Vito was meant to find me so that he could, uh, so he could convert to to Catholicism. That's uh, that's my uh, that's probably what it is. So he is Italian. Yeah. See, it's all coming. It's all making sense now. Where, so where do you think all this? Where do you think this independent? I mean, a lot of things. Like, so where do you think Comic Skate goes from here? Where do you think? Um, entertainment and just the the news business goes from here. Everything is changing like so dramatically. The world we are heading into is so different than the world that you and I came from. What do you think all this is going to be like? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity because like so many people have tuned out of Star Trek and Marvel and Star Wars and all that. I'm even noticing like I made a video just about like, hey, you know, uh, here George Lucas is slamming Star Wars the other the other day. And three years ago, that would have gone through the roof and probably made my entire channel, right? Uh, Now, like, people are so burnt out on just how bad Star Wars has been since 2018 that they've tuned out. They don't care anymore. They've they've actually weaned themselves from the corporate product, which means all these people are out there, which with this, like, you know, billion-person audience who loved this sort of thing is out there uh, wanting uh, 
and and desiring content that actually is good again. And so if you uh, can provide that, I think you have a pretty good uh, uh, ability to compete in this market. Now, of course, you know, the market's wide, wide open and the barrier to entry is almost zero for everybody. Um, and with AI, that's even going to get harder. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, the, the corporations have made it a little bit easy for uh, them to lose their influence, which I love. Now, on the other front, uh, you kind of still have to talk about the trending topics in order to get attention. And I, I, I read this in a, I, in a, I, I took a marketing class. I, I'm actually, I have a business background for all this. And in that, uh, when they were talking about marketing and, and building social media platforms, the first thing they told you, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, nobody cares about you. Um, and so if you're posting Instagram about you and what you ate today and who you're hanging out with and where you're going and whatever, you're not going to grow an audience beyond your immediate family and your like, you know, grandma going, oh, that's really nice. You look beautiful um, because they don't care. You, you have to post about uh, things people care about. And so, you know, Warhammer, Doctor Who, those are hot topics right now. Stellar Blade. Um, those are the things people care about. And if you have a fresh and interesting take, you're going to get some attention. And sometimes even if you don't have a fresh and interesting take, you'll still get attention and luck out on it. But you have to like definitely ratio the content to uh, what people care about to about you to a certain extent. Otherwise, your audience doesn't grow. And you're seeing a lot of the bigger channels that came up in 2018, 2019, 2020, um, and I'm not naming anybody specific, but like, you know, you see a lot of them turn their content model to, oh, this is all about me and what I'm doing now, rather than about the topics they used to be on. And even if, you know, th they have their loyal audiences, but you notice they don't grow as much anymore. They just kind of are happy with where they're at. So that's, uh, you, you, you can maintain and you can be there, but if you want to grow, you have to be where the conversation's at. Yeah. I mean... I, I can understand someone because some people they they get tired of having to be on the edge or being in the be in the chaos. They just it is exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, I I'm certain there will be some interesting and new projects in your future that will come together. I think that McFarland interview is so interesting because he's such an influential guy in the world of comic books. But he's, he's, I won't call himself a recluse exactly, but he doesn't go in the public eye very often. How did you manage that, by the way? And what did you, what do you think of the guy? Um, I am on a bunch of email lists for comic uh, public relations now. And uh, I get requests for interviews for, for people all the time. Um, and I ignore almost all of them because it would kill my channel to interview some random person doing a scholastic, uh, you know, children's graphic novel or whatever well, I don't even know who it is um but when I saw but I got an email from Todd McFarlane's people and I just said sure I'll, I'll have them on uh they they approached me so was the answer <laughs> um and uh that's driving a lot of people crazy because I the immediately when when I posted I had that they're like how much did you have to pay him blah blah blah, blah. sorry I've, I've got a channel that like I'm one of the biggest influencers in comics now and that's that's not to toot my own horn it actually is the state of how bad comics are uh, that a 20,000 sub channel would be a biggest influencer in comics. Um, it's, it's really, it's really dismal out there, but I probably have a better, uh, shot at getting word out about his new product line that he was talking about than, uh, you know, most of the people who, you know, if you, if you look up Marvel comics writers and the channels they go on, they're like 500 sub channels, thousand sub channels, and they're getting hundred to even Heather Antos, for example, she goes on these shows where they get like two, 300 views. It's like, why would they bother? Um, that, that is the only other option of people who actually talk about comics right now. Maybe you can land Heather Antos as a, as a comic creator. I mean, I know you've had, uh, illustrious uh, people in the know. industry, like, uh, like Alyssa Mercante on your I, show. I, I, I don't so, know about that. I mean, I'm like, I don't know. I'd have to think on that. I'd have to think on that. I'd watch. I get, it would, it might be interesting. I don't know. It depends how candid they are. Uh, Cause I guess, you know, I don't. I don't really like doing interviews or watching interviews where it's very, I don't want to say the word fake, but it's very, it's very professional. It's almost to the point where it's dishonest and no one's actually saying anything of worth. And I don't know. That's just not. How much of you for me. are you putting into Star Trek and who are your, your greatest influences in comics? <laughs> I would say name five other comic book creators. Just name them. I, I, I was watching 85. an interview, and, and they literally did that. Who, who's your greatest influencer in comics? And she was like, 
well, I've just kind of always loved comics. And it, it, the answer is you can't name five. I can though. Uh, my 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 uh, my my comic influencers who I, I probably I, I very much uh, look up to are uh, um, Steve Ditko uh, and and of course uh, not just because of his Spider Man work but because of the work that he did with his uh, independent objectivist comics, which I just I think are mind blowing. Uh, number two uh, will be Tom DeFalco. Tom DeFalco does not get good, good credit for writing. He was editor in chief of Marvel Comics in the early '90s and late '80s, uh, but he was a prolific writer, and he just he he had that serialized storytelling down where it's like he'd increase the character drama a little bit every issue, and it build and build and build and build and build. Um, wonderful writer. Uh, number three would be J. Michael Straczynski uh, because of his work on Babylon Five. He he created the serial space opera on TV in a way that nobody had ever done before. And while he's a Trump deranged idiot now, that work stands the test of time. Yeah, it's yeah. Beautiful. And the CBS tried to steal it from him. Yeah. They did. Yeah. And they kind of did with Deep Space Nine, and that's another story. Uh, number four would be Chuck Dixon. Uh, the guy's work ethic is second to none. Uh, he, I think he is the most prolific printed comic creator ever, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, and I look up to him almost more than anybody else out there. And then, uh, let's see, who would my number five be then at that point? Um, it would probably be... Let me think. Um, I'm, I'm looking around my comic shelves for, like, who is it for real? Um, probably uh, uh, Pierre Christian and uh, Jean-Claude Maziers, uh, who did uh, Valerian, just because Valerian's such a big influence on me. Uh, they're, they're, that book... Uh, that a series of books was out of control. Yeah. That movie of the same name, not so much. It wasn't as bad as people say it is. Like I, I give it a little benefit of the doubt. It was a bad casting choice uh, for the, <laughs> let's just say. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you shouldn't put yourself down, but you were right that the, the world of American comic books, Western comic books, has shrunk remarkably to where the point where, yeah, like 20,000, a 20,000 following is considered a big deal now. Right. That's correct. And if, if you look at comic channels that used to be comic channels, uh, Yellow Flash got to start that way. Umbrella Guy got to start that way. But they both pivoted away from comics really hard uh, because you can't, you, at some point you just stagnate and nobody's interested in these topics at all. Um, I'm looking at, I watch My main competitors probably at this point are, uh, thinking critical and comics by perch in terms of YouTube. And I, I watch my competitors, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, and, uh, I, I like some of their videos and, you know, don't like some of their other ones. And I, I try to learn from what's working for them and what's not. But if you're watching, they they do pure comic content now and you're watching they're they're not getting views that i am at this point even though their channels are two or three times bigger than mine and uh that's that's uh that's that's a bad sign for the comic book industry people really have tuned out uh and it really should be all hands on deck and i don't think i don't think that their content's changed that much i, I don't uh, view their channels as having problems i view the the content that they're talking about uh as the problem because just people do not care about whatever's happening at Marvel and DC anymore. That's too bad. I mean, at the same time, Mongo, of course, is booming. So there is interest for a similar format. It's just not happening with us. Cause our, That's right. The, yeah. the books that people know about just suck. They're terrible. <laughs> well, this has been fun, John. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know you're a, a very busy guy. I'm not quite sure how you keep so many uh, pans in the, in the fire. You're always working on something new. Always. Just busy, busy, I, busy, I wake busy. Up, I wake up at six. I look for the news items of the day. I write an article, try to write an article by seven. And this is what I tell people I do every day. Um, I give my kids breakfast and take them to school from seven to eight. Uh, I try to go to the gym twice a week, eight to nine. And then the other days, I come back home and I do my YouTube work uh, about eight to nine. And if I'm at the gym, I do it nine to ten. Uh, then uh, I get to work. I do my writing, you know, uh, over the course of the day and, um, uh, and then try to get offline by five as much as possible to, you know, hang out with the kids at night. And I go to bed early. I don't go out and party very much. And, uh, I just make sure it's all about the work. So <laughs> reminds so me of, uh, Brandon yeah. Sanderson. He says something very similar. Yeah. Ooh, it, I mean, that discipline is rewarding. It does reward you.
you have many successful books. You have a lot of cool projects. That's nice to see. And I think we'll continue to see it. I don't know. I, I have a good feeling about it. I think you'll continue to go far, John. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. All right, guys. I think we're going to wrap it up here. Where can people find you for your, for your your many projects? Just pick a few. Where can people find you? John Delarose YouTube, John Delarose Twitter, and uh, John Delarose on Amazon is probably the easiest way. Uh, I've got a lot of books uh, in print and audio on there. Uh, you can find them. Uh, I, I'm typing the uh, Stars Entwined in that trilogy right now, um, which that's really my baby that it really, like when I was into Babylon 5 back in the day and I wanted to become a professional writer, that was I, that was the universe I was conceiving. And uh, I'm actually spinning out a series out of that that I'm writing right now, uh, which is going to be a space exploration series uh, akin to Star Trek. Because I, you know, Star Trek used to be about, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, about extreme, exploring strange new worlds, and now it's just about exploring somebody's sexual fetishes. Um, and so I'm, I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying to like bring that back to like the original vision, which was not, which was not a, you know, one of the guys from the writers today, he, he made a tweet saying it's always been about diversity and representation. Actually, it, like it was pitched as a western in space, wagon train to the stars. It was actually about uh exceptional humanism and expansionism and manifest destiny so <laughs> you're, you're very wrong that it was always about diversity uh and that's uh that's where i'm going to bring it back to i'm going to try to uh, capture that original series ethos where you know people are, are out there looking uh out to the stars and actually trying to uh you know accomplish real things in the name of humanity all right well i will check it out this has been fun. Thank you so much, John. Uh, people, please check out his projects. I'm sure if you use Twitter, you will find him if he doesn't find you. <laughs> and uh, we're going to end it here, guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Uh, this show is made possible with the good help of the people at Bain Books Publishing, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, and, of course, Young Voices, a journalism advocacy organization. And, of course, like viewers and listeners like you. I couldn't do it without you. And to my uh, my friend, an amazing editor who looks makes me look way more competent than I actually am, Chris Hollywicky. thank you so much. And uh, until next time, everyone, keep geeking out. Hey there, gang. If you are a fan of Culturescape, and I know you are, and want to get involved in supporting the show, well, now you can. By joining the Culturescape Patreon, you'll help support me and my editor, Chris, as we create the show and produce more quality journalism. For just $5 or $10 a month, you not only help us, but get access to our exclusive members-only Discord. You'll also get to vote on and suggest new guests for the interview. So if you are a fellow weeb and love Culturescape, then come join us today on Patreon. 